Aircraft make some of the best platforms for science here on Earth. From weather balloons to study the high atmosphere to aircraft that fly into the hearts of hurricanes. From surveys of Antarctic ice sheets to drones. So it makes sense to consider missions to any world in the solar system with an atmosphere. Balloons to Venus and helicopters to Titan. But one world that's been the most seriously considered for exploration by air is Mars. As we've mentioned time and time again in the past, Mars sucks, especially its atmosphere. You can't breathe it. You can't use it to keep in your precious fluids. It ruins spacecraft. What's it good for? It turns out it could be possible to fly in the thin atmosphere of Mars. An aircraft's lift depends on the atmospheric density, velocity, and the area of the wing. Since the Martian atmosphere is less dense, you've got to compensate with either a faster speed or a much larger wing area. The one thing in an airplane's favor, though, is the lower gravity on Mars, only 38% of Earth. For a faster speed, you need more energy, but solar radiation on Mars is much less than what we can enjoy here on Earth. For a bigger wing area, you've got to deal with the limits of landing large, complex payloads on Mars, which we talked about in the previous episode. Needless to say, this will be tough. But surprisingly, it's possible. Space agencies have been trying to work out a way to make it happen for years. One of the earliest ideas came from Werner von Braun, the architect of Germany's rocketry program during World War II, as well as the architect for NASA's human exploration of the moon. In his Mars project concept, he proposed that interplanetary spaceship would be able to deploy gliders to enter the Martian atmosphere. But then it was discovered that Mars' atmosphere was a fraction of the density of Earth's, and the idea was discarded. In fact, I've done a whole episode on the Mars project, so I'll link to it here. Once they knew the actual density of Mars' atmosphere, NASA began to seriously consider aircraft for Mars in the 1970s. Another challenge is that Mars doesn't have enough oxygen in its atmosphere to provide combustion for jet fuel. In 1977, NASA's Dryden Research Center proposed a propeller-driven aircraft powered by hydrazine, a common rocket fuel propellant that has its own oxidizer. They built a prototype based on their mini-sniffer uncrewed aerial vehicles and did some tests to see if the technology could work. In the 1980s, NASA shifted their plans to a totally new idea. Instead of having an aircraft that would land on the surface of Mars and take off again, they considered an aircraft that would enter the atmosphere directly and start flying at hypersonic speeds. In 1996, NASA started exploring the Airplane for Mars Exploration, or AIM. This would use a propeller and a large wingspan sailplane. In 1998, they refined their idea to build a large folding glider called Kitty Hawk, which would unfold at an altitude of 12,000 meters above the surface of Mars and then glide until it crashed. In 2002, NASA's Langley proposed a Mars aircraft called Ares, or the Aerial Regional Scale Environmental Survey. Ares would have been sent to Mars in an aeroshell similar to the Viking landers. Once it got into the thick part of its atmosphere, the aircraft would deploy a parachute, unfold its wings, and then fire its liquid propulsion engine. It would then be able to fly through the Martian atmosphere for about 500 kilometers, sciencing as hard as it could, before crashing onto the surface of Mars all that expense for a few minutes of flight. In order to maintain flight and avoid stalling, aircraft need to fly at least 350 kilometers per hour on Mars. This means they pass over the landscape too quickly to collect a lot of science. Too fast, not enough science. Next idea was to build an aircraft with a very large wing that could actually fly around in the thin Martian atmosphere for longer, but not much longer. In 2015, scientists flew a test glider concept called the Preliminary Research Aerodynamic Design to Land on Mars, or Prandtl M, which also happens to be the name of the German engineer Ludwig Prandtl, who developed a lot of the mathematics for flight. See how these acronyms work? The Prandtl M is one big wing with no tail designed to create the minimum amount of drag and maximize flight time. Imagine an albatross made of carbon fiber and aluminum. The aircraft would be small enough to fit within a CubeSat sent to Mars. When the spacecraft arrived at Mars and had decelerated through the atmosphere, it would deploy the aircraft. 
it would use its low drag to glide through the atmosphere for about 10 minutes, traversing 32 kilometers of distance before crashing onto the surface of Mars. That's not much, but it would be a relatively inexpensive way to scout out a potential landing ellipse for a future mission sent to a hazardous region of Mars. Several versions were tested out, but in the end, a very different aircraft was chosen to fly on Mars, which we'll get to shortly. Next idea, flapping wings on Mars. No, I'm not kidding. Mars aircraft could flap their wings like an insect. A fancier name for a flapping wing aircraft is an entomopter. Just like insects, they don't generate lift in the same way that a bird's wings work. Instead, insects keep themselves aloft by forming and then shedding vortices on their wings. As part of a NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts grant in 2002, researcher Anthony Colosa proposed that an entomopter with a one meter wingspan could generate a similar lift that an insect on Earth might enjoy. The aircraft wouldn't need to fly quickly, it would just need to flap its wings really quickly. This would be incredibly power intensive, of course, burning through its hydrazine fuel quickly. If it was battery powered, however, an entomopter could deploy from a rover, flap around to do some scouting, and then land again to recharge its batteries. I love this idea, and I hope that someone continues to develop it. What about balloons? Of course NASA is considered balloons. Balloons work in the Earth's atmosphere because the gases are less dense than air. Fill a balloon with hydrogen, helium, or hot air, and it'll gain altitude as long as the payload is light enough. It's a little more tricky on Mars, of course, since its atmosphere is so thin. A Martian balloon mission could be equipped with a tank of helium, which inflates as soon as the spacecraft arrives at Mars. Then it would jettison its heavy tanks and float around the Martian atmosphere at a constant altitude. This idea was proposed by Robert Zubrin and colleagues back in 1993 as the Mars Aerial Platform. This Discovery class mission would fly at an altitude of 7 kilometers above the surface of Mars for hundreds or even thousands of days, imaging the surface at a greater resolution than had ever been seen before. Another idea would be a hot air balloon inflated with locally sourced Martian carbon dioxide atmosphere. The sun would heat up the gas trapped inside the balloon, giving it lift compared to the surrounding atmosphere. But it would only be able to operate during the day heating up in the sun, going airborne for a few hours, then descending during the Martian night to rest on the surface. This would provide a challenge of snagging its lines each time it comes down to rest. It would only be a matter of time before it got tangled up on a rocky outcrop. I've got some good news for you. NASA has actually committed to an actual flying mission to Mars, and we'll actually get to that in a second. But first, I'd like to thank Kevin Ross Manning, Charles Bowles, Dustin Roeff, DJ Cash, Simon Poole, and the rest of our 812 patrons for their generous support. If you love what we're doing, you want to get in on the action, head over to patreon.com slash universe today. As NASA was developing their plans for the Mars 2020 rover, they wanted to include some kind of flying vehicle with the mission. In 2017, NASA Langley developed the concept of the Mars Flyer, an autonomous winged drone that would be tucked in beside the rover as it traveled to Mars. Once on the surface, 2020 would use its robotic arm to gently place the aircraft on the surface. From there, it would take off vertically and then transition to horizontal flight once it was going fast enough. The aircraft would be maneuverable enough to explore cliff sides and lava tubes autonomously, mapping the surroundings and relaying them back to the rover. And then once it ran out of battery power, it returns to the launch pad for a recharge. In 2018, NASA announced that they would be including a tiny autonomous vehicle with the Mars 2020 rover launching in July of that year. Known as the Mars Helicopter, this tiny vehicle is about the size of a softball and weighs only 1.8 kilograms. It has two counter-rotating blades that spin at 3,000 times a minute, generating enough lift in the thin Martian atmosphere that it can actually fly around. When the Mars 2020 rover arrives at the Red Planet, it will be carrying the Mars helicopter on board. The rover will search its surroundings for a good launch site, gently place the helicopter on the ground, and then move away to a safe distance. The helicopter will charge up its batteries with onboard solar panels and then begin a series of fully autonomous test flights going longer and longer distances over the course of 30 days. On the first flight, for example, it'll fly to an altitude of 3 meters and hover for about 30 seconds. 
Because it takes many minutes to communicate with Mars, the helicopter will need to make its own decisions, avoiding terrain and choosing a safe landing site. This is just a test to demonstrate if a robotic helicopter like this makes sense. Future Mars missions could include one or several of these flying scouts, which would help them identify important features on the landscape from above. Imagine future astronauts exploring the surface of Mars with a cloud of tiny drones helping them scout the landscape. Awesome! Getting a vehicle that could fly in the thin atmosphere of Mars is going to be tough. Every idea has compromises, but if engineers can crack it, there's nothing more effective than getting a bird's eye view of the landscape ahead. I wouldn't be surprised to see more flying vehicles joining future landers and rovers sent to Mars. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links so that you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so you can have the latest episodes show up right on your device? Go to universetoday.com audio to get the one you want, and I'll put the links in the show notes. And finally, here's a playlist.